We might say prophesying. I'm not sure I can prophesy. But, you know, in, in, our, in our words, it would be preaching. It would be talking to people. It would be telling what was heavenly and what was uh, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So in that sense, we can prophesy too because we're telling what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen. Did you really ever think about that? I can tell you what's going to happen. Does that mean I'm a miracle worker or that I have special powers? No. I've got it in the Bible. It tells me what's going to happen. In chapters 10 through 13, Jesus had sent out the apostles, or the, excuse me, the disciples at this point, to preach, heal, and raise the dead. And, you know, we kind of just read over that, and it's like, oh, that was great. Raise the dead? Wait a minute. <laughs> uh, that's pretty ser uh, serious there. Healing people? That's also pretty serious. So Jesus sent them out and gave them uh, really miraculous powers and said, go and, and preach the gospel to all these people. And by the way, I'm giving you the ability to do some things that are going to be really special. So uh, just giving you a, a, a few verses. This is out of Mark. It says, they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Wow. Wow. That's another one you just kind of read over, and it's like, that's a huge, huge deal, that they, they were able to drive out demons. That's not an easy thing to do. Um, I've never driven out a demon. How about you? Um, so anyway, that was supposed to be funny. Uh, King, <laughs> and so he also gave us several parables, uh, particularly in chapter 13, uh, the, the importance of attitude. So the... the the parable of the sower in the soil, and he goes through the four different types of soil, and it's really all about the attitude. How are you going to receive the seed? In other words, how are you going to receive the message of the gospel? You know, some people will receive it and, and grow from it, and other people will take it in and then uh, eventually fall away. And then we also read about uh, a couple of parables about evil and how there's evil among us and it's mixed in with the good and that's something that many of us struggle with right now is that um, why are the where are they all these evil people why are they allowed to exist in this this place where God has made it and God made this perfect world and yet there's all these evil people um, so these two parables talk about how God's waiting till the day of judgment and at that time, he'll gather the wheat, and he'll gather the weeds, and he'll burn up the weeds. And that's just a, a uh, metaphor for saying, you know, the evil people are going to be sent to hell, and the, the good people are going to be gathered up and brought to heaven. So um, it's a good way for us to pay attention and say, you know, I understand that there's still going to be evil people, and it's okay, because God is going to make it right. And so finally, Christians are citizens of the kingdom, but we're not yet home. So our title last week was the now and the not yet. So now we're in the kingdom of heaven as Christians, but we're not yet home. And so there is a, a hope and a longing to be able to get there, but we're not right there yet. So by the way, if you didn't notice, the, the words that are bolded and underlined are the ones where you fill in the blank. I meant, meant to say that earlier. Okay, so... Now we're going to talk about our, our text for today, which is chapters 14 and 15. And so look at all the things that happen in this uh, two chapters. These are all stories that are pretty familiar to, uh, to those of us who have been going to church for a while. Um, that's a lot of stuff. And these are a lot of things that, that people have known, you know, as... as uh, Bible students for a long time, the, the feeding of the 5,000. I mean, you've probably heard a lot of stories, uh, a lot of sermons about that. John the Baptist is beheaded, uh, Jesus walking on the water, uh, Jesus surrounded by the crowds and clamoring to, to be near him. In fact, I titled this uh, lesson, Clamoring to Be with Jesus, because I think, you know, it's very clear when you read these two chapters and, and really the whole book of Matthew that Jesus was followed by crowds everywhere he went. And, you know, the fact that there were people clamoring to see him is really awesome. And wouldn't it be great if everybody was clamoring to see Jesus today? 
Because that's really what we want Jesus to be prominent in the lives of people, that they want to be with Jesus, even though in spirit. And then uh, God also, or Jesus also cast out a demon, and then he fed 5,000 people, and then later he fed 4,000 people. And I don't know if you realize it, but the 4,000 people were not Jews. That was in a different part of that region, which was not a Jewish region. So we're going to be talking about not all of that, but, but some of it as we go through today. So as we go through this, and again, I'm kind of assuming that you know a little bit about these stories, is Jesus experienced many highs and lows. There were some great things that happened, some rejoicing that happened, but there were also some periods of, of great uh, sadness. And again, if you were Jesus, you would be thinking as a human, even though he was all God, he was also all human, that he would be experiencing sadness about some of these things. And of course, the most sad thing, I think, out of this uh, section is losing John the Baptist, that he was beheaded um, in this particular time. And so Jesus was kind of in a lot of a stressful situation, he was dealing with all these crowds that were pressing around him. He never really had time to, uh, to mourn the loss of John. Um, but also some praises. He was able to see the faith of his disciples growing. And he also was able to see joy when someone was healed. So I'm not going to read all of this slide to you. You can read that. But there was a lot of kind of ups and downs. And again, from the human side, you can see how this would be difficult. And so we can, we can kind of read where Jesus withdrew to a quiet place to pray, where he got in the boat and he went into a solitary place. There's several phrases in the New Testament that talk about Jesus taking time to go and be in a quiet place and so that he could pray. And that's a pretty good piece of advice right there because we're surrounded by chaos. We're surrounded by crowds. They're not clamoring to see me, but they're just crowds. There's just a lot of people. There's a lot of stuff going on. And so sometimes it's like, I wish I could just have some quiet. And so you have to force that. You have to make time for that. You have to be intentional about that. And Jesus did that. So if Jesus felt the need to do that, we probably should do that too. You know, finding a quiet time to go and pray and be with in communion with the Lord. Um, likewise, and you can see this on your handout, the disciples experienced a lot of highs and lows. So there's really nothing to, f to uh, fill out on your form about this, but you know, if you read through that list of activities, and the, the chart on the right is totally made up by me, so don't say, well, how did you get that data, John? Um, but I just kind of looked at each one of those events a through R, and thought, okay, that was kind of a high point, that was kind of a low point, this is kind of a middle point, and just kind of put them on a graph. And these are all in sequential order. So if you, if you are willing to accept John's graph of uh, highs and lows here, look at that. That's kind of a, I wouldn't want to ride that roller coaster, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, it would be pretty terrifying to go from these really high highs to very lows and then back up and then, oh, and ah, oh. You know, it's really difficult. So, um, I don't know if you've ever thought about that. And if, if, you, if you read through the New Testament and as best you can try to understand the sequence of events, it was difficult. Is this your life, by the way? Does anybody have this kind of whoop, 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 whoop? Anybody? All right, a few hands went up. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel that sometimes too. Like, I think things are going great. Oh, that just happened. Oh, things are great. And then, you know, it's just... So, I mean, it's difficult to kind of be steady, right? And, and as Christians, we're called to be, you know, steady because even though things are going poorly at a particular time, guess what? We know we have a promise of heaven. We know we're going to heaven. Yeah, this is bad, but having a heavenly perspective, I can accept, yes, things are going badly right now, but it's okay because I've still got a home in heaven. And when things are going great, you think, well, I know this is nice, but 
you know, it's, uh, it's not so nice as it's going to be in heaven. So, you know, don't get too excited about this world. So, um, microphone, who, John? Yeah. Loopy's got a comment. And then Lance has got a comment. See if we're on. We are on. Good. Okay. I was just going to say, when we have bad times, we need to stop and think. There's always something to be grateful for. Mm -hmm. And it's not an easy thing when we're struggling with the bad things. But if we put our mindset on what Jesus has already done on the cross for us, that's my go-to. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hurting. It's, you know, whatever it is right. that's negative. If we focus on what Jesus has already <clears throat> promised us. Very good. Very good. So Lance had his hand up there, and then uh, Jason's got his hand up. So I've got to keep in order. So Lance and then Jason. This is good. I like the comments. Yeah, I just learned something recently that people that see a visual with something you're talking about, it helps them to retain that information mm -hmm. up to a year later to like 63% accuracy. Wow. So I'm going to go ahead and point out your awesome graphic that shows even when on the downhill slide, it's moving forward, right. right? We're always progressing forward. Even when it feels like we're at the bottom of the world and everything is landing on us, God is still taking us forward. Yeah. Even through the, we usually have more growth through the negative experiences than through the positive. So look at that visual and remember that God is always moving us forward, even in the tough times. Amen. Yeah, amen. Thank you, Lance. That's a really good point. And, and also, if you kind of look back on your life and you say, I went through a really bad period here, but it didn't stay there. You know, God helped me through it. Go ahead, Jason. And uh, picking back what Loopy was saying about counting our blessings, uh, the difficult times can also be considered a blessing. Uh, we may not see the bigger picture, but God does. And he's preparing us just like he was preparing disciples for uh, right. something later on. And yeah. You know, sometimes when we go through that difficult time, we are able to know how to get through it and help somebody else going through something similar later Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, I think that that's, that is so important to, to see that. And it's also important, I think, to see that um, not only in your life, but if you look at what the disciples went through, if you think about what David went through, if you think about what pretty much any person in the Bible went through, it was not steady. It was not a constant upward trajectory. They dealt with struggles. They dealt with persecution. They dealt with disappointment. And God doesn't gloss over any of that. He just lays it right out there and says, this is what actually happened to these people. And you think, well, you know, I thought when I became a Christian, everything was going to be great. And, you know, just my life was going to be perfect. No, that wasn't a promise. Where was that? You know, what scripture is that? That's not in there. Um, you know, the perfection is going to come in heaven, right? So we have to wait for that. Okay, we'll keep going. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a story um, about John the Baptist. And so I think this, this story is really important. So I'm reading it out of Mark, even though it's in Matthew 14. There's more detail in Mark. So forgive me for going off script. You can give me 40 lashes later. So King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work with him. Others said he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. So now we're going to hear the backstory. For Herod himself had given, given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John... He was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Isn't that interesting? Put him in jail, but he, he, he knows he's a righteous man. 
Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. Wow. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with her request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. There's no, there's no gap there. There's nothing you can say. Right now, he, she wants it. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guest, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went beheaded John in the prison and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. That's a terrible story. So just kind of recapping what we just read, John had confronted Herod, and this is Herod Antipas, for taking Herodias, the wife of Philip, to be his wife. This is kind of a sordid story. In fact, if you read about the family of Herod the Great, there's a lot of Herods, by the way, so you say, man, that guy is everywhere. No, there was actually <laughs> a lot of Herods. Um, they went by that name. It's kind of like King so-and-so or King so-and-so. So all of them were related to each other, and they took the name Herod. But anyway, one brother took from the other brother's wife and married her. And John called this unlawful, which it is. I mean, just calling it what it is, it's not like he would made this stuff up. And so Herod arrested John, but he feared killing him. He knew that John was right. It's like, you know, this guy is confronting me and telling me I'm sinning, and yet I know, I know I'm sinning. I'm not sure why I'm staticky, but I am... Okay, maybe it's the other microphone. Okay. All right, well, I'll try to just stand still like a statue. <laughs> Don't move. Uh, see, I did it again. All right, but he didn't repent. So um, Herodias, again, the wife, wanted John killed because she was calling him out. Yes, John. Well, maybe if I hold it here, it won't. It won't do that. That's Sir? That's better. Yeah, that's better. Okay. All right. So anyway, so he was arrested. Herod was not willing to kill him. His daughter enticed Herod, and Herod made a stupid promise. I'll do anything for you. You can have anything you want up to half of my kingdom. And so John was beheaded because of the promise, and then Jesus was the one who experienced great loss. And so this is, you know, when you think about it, he, he lost his cousin, his friend, his prophet, and his baptizer all at once. Can you imagine? Is there anybody closer that uh, he could have lost? And so this was a huge toll on him, yet he didn't really ever have time to mourn because if you read through the story... The next thing you know, he's got crowds all around him wanting to have some of his time. And so this is a very difficult story, and it's, I, I don't like it. And again, it, you have to imagine, if I was writing this story, I'd probably try to sugarcoat some of this because it just is so awful. But God doesn't sugarcoat these stories. He just lays it out and says, this is what happened. This is really what happened. And so Jesus is experiencing this loss. So, looking back at the life of John, he started off his adult ministry preaching about repenting. And so this was a very important thing for him in his, in his life. That was what he was sent to do. He spent time prophesying about the kingdom and the Messiah. And, of course, we know that he announced Jesus as the Messiah in his ministry. Uh, he spent time baptizing people for repentance. Because he was called to do that. He was told 
This is what you're supposed to do. And then he spent time confronting the Pharisees. You remember that? They would come to say, wonder what's going on with this guy out in the desert. Why are all these people coming to see him? And he said, you brood of vipers. Who told you to flee the coming wrath? You know, that, that was the nice way of putting it, of course. Uh, not really. Uh, so, you know, he's confronting them. And then he baptized Jesus. He confronted Herod, of course. We just read that. And then he suffered in prison. He spent a lot of time in prison uh, as a result of Herod's uh, hypocrisy. Um, he did express doubt while he was in prison. He sent a message to Jesus to say, are you the one we should have been waiting for, or is there someone else? So even though he knew and he had been the one to announce Jesus as Messiah, he, exper he experienced some doubt, which <clears throat> is a human thing. When you're sitting in prison, you have to wonder, is this the way it's supposed to be? Because I, I wouldn't like this. You know, I would not have written it this way. So he expressed some doubt. <clears throat> and then, of course, he was beheaded in prison. So other than being beheaded in prison, how much of this can we do today? If you look at those underlying words, preaching about repenting, prophesying about the kingdom, baptizing, confronting, suffering. Can we do those today? Okay, I'm seeing some heads nodding. Yeah, I mean, this is all stuff we can do. You know, we, we, we probably might say prophesying. I'm not sure I can prophesy. But, you know, in, in, our, in our words, it would be preaching. It would be talking to people. It would be telling what was heavenly and what was uh, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So in that sense, we can prophesy too because we're telling what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen. Did you really ever think about that? I can tell you what's going to happen. Does that mean I'm a miracle worker or that I have special powers? No. I've got it in the Bible. It tells me what's going to happen. So I can prophesy in that respect. But, you know, this is all important for us to say, you know, I can emulate the life of John, and I can do what he did, and please God as a result. Yeah, Jan? Uh, John, can you bring the microphone? He's coming. He lost the microphone. <laughs> I think one of the neatest things about John that we can emulate today is when some of his followers came to him and, and asked him about Jesus, and his quote was, he must increase, I must decrease. Right. And, and I think if we could adapt that attitude, our walk would be a lot stronger. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's, that is a, an expression of humility that we could all learn from. You know, he must increase, I must decrease. Monty's got his hand up in the back there. I'll go back to that slide in case you ran out of time writing down the answers. One of the things you don't have underlined, but I think some of us might relate to, is expressing doubt. There may be times in our life when things aren't going right, and, and uh, we're wondering, and I'm not saying that we're denying, but we're just saying, God, how come this is happening? I mean, yeah. I've been trying to do the right thing and, and so forth. And so that little doubt can come in. But I think um, if our faith is strong, we realize it's going to be all right because Jesus said it's going to be all right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And I think, again, if you look at other people in the Bible, you know, David expressed doubt. Other people expressed doubt. So this is... Uh, not working real well. I can't even put it in my shirt pocket. Okay. Statue. All right. So this is a, a very good example for us today is, is uh, kind of the, the message there. So let's go forward. And so I, in my crazy mind, I was thinking about, you know, how was John confronting Herod? Herod's the king. How do you confront him? And so I thought, well, what, what if he had a cardboard sign? It just said, stop breaking God's law. I think that's funny. But, you know, it, it be, it's kind of like that same thing. You know, what, what can you do? You know, let's say you, you disagree with somebody that's very prominent. And how am I going to get an audience with that person? Um, and yet, John went out of his way, somehow, some way, to confront the king 
with his sin. Uh, he couldn't be silent. Have you ever felt that way? I just, I can't be silent about this. I have to say something. This is terrible. Somebody's got to do something. Maybe it should be me. And so John went really far out there to say, I'm going to confront the king with his sin. Um, so how would we handle that situation? And I'm not asking for a show of hands or a confession here, but uh, would we stay silent? Would we just think, you know, he should stop doing that? Or would we talk to other people and say, you know, he's, he's doing the wrong thing. He should not have done that. He should stop doing that. Or would we confront the sinner and say, you're doing the wrong thing. You need to change your life. You need to repent. And again, I'm not asking for a show of hands, but it's, it's one of those things that if you think about it, you can probably think about a situation right now that you might say, you know, staying silent's not working. Talking to other people about what's going on, not working. Maybe I need to go talk to the person themselves and say lovingly, underline lovingly, <laughs> I think you're going the wrong way. I think you need to turn around. I think you need to change and do something different. And if, you, if that rings a bell for you, all I would say is pray about that. Express in love. You've got to underline in love and tell them. Brother, sister, I, th I think you're messing up. You know, I, I need you to really pay attention and do something about this. John, Mark's got his hand up. And that's, that's not easy to do, but I really, really, really believe that's what God calls us to do. Because how are you going to save your brother or sister who's going down the path of evil if you don't say anything about it? It's just, it's just what you have to do. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, that was so good what you just said, because when we do confront someone, we can <clears throat> actually say, you know, it really is a whole lot easier for me to not say anything and just let this fly. Mm -hmm. And I'm not here to judge you because they're going to throw things. Judge not that you be not yep. be judged. Yep. Uh, don't give me that holier than thou. Uh, why are you condemning me? Uh, we're all allowed to make our own choices in life. And that, well, yeah, but all actions have consequences. And if yep. we love someone so much, we're trying to help them. And I agree with what you're saying as far as having that prayerful attitude and of love. And then there are people in our lives that are prophets. It is black and white. It is whatever God says. And that so was John. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't have his wife. Da, 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 da. You can just see him just in yeah. his face about this. It's like, wow. Yeah. And just, you know, I'm not that kind of person, but he is that kind of person. And we need them in our lives. Yep. That type of prophetic person that says, I don't care how you feel, this is truth. Yeah. And then some of us say, and that is truth, and let me help you <laughs> so that you'll do this right. So yeah. Everybody's different, and we all help each other. Yeah. Monty's got his hand back there. So I'll just briefly say, <clears throat> I've done this before, and I've been rejected for it, and I've also seen that person turn their life around later on because they thought about it, and it became clear that I think you're right. Go ahead, Monty. I'm just going to say our attitude is so important as we interact with others, and particularly in a situation where someone is struggling with a, a big problem. <clears throat> and I think if we can approach them with the idea that uh, I know you're struggling, I'm concerned about that, I'm concerned for you, um, here's some thoughts I have that might help you get through this or help you to get in a better place. I think that shows them the motive is really wanting to help them as opposed to saying, you know, you really shouldn't do that because that's bad. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Monty. And so just to quickly go through this, you know, what can we take away from John's life? <clears throat> 
that he did that we could do. So, you know, urging people to repent, pointing people to Jesus, confronting sinfulness as we just talked about, and then allowing ourselves to suffer for righteousness. So you may be rejected, you may be mistreated, you may be shunned when you do these things, but that is a small amount of suffering in exchange for the blessing that you're trying to give. And if people misunderstand, then you know, you know that you're doing right by God. And so even though Herod killed John and might look like evil one, no way. Because we know where Herod is, and we know where John is, and that's what really matters. By the way, Herod was deposed and put into exile and was a pariah uh, a few years later. So, feeding huge crowds. So, anybody heard the story about feeding the 5,000 before? Come on. Okay, I was going to say, it's like 10 people in the whole crowd. <laughs> Got to be more than that. So, so the disciples were unable to believe that it was possible to feed them. And so we see in the, in the account in Matthew, Jesus said, you give them something to eat. The disciples came to him and said, you know, we're going to send all these people home because, you know, they're, they're hungry and it's time to eat and we don't have enough food for them. And Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Me? Are you kidding me? Have you looked at this crowd? You know, a, a month's wages wouldn't pay for all these people. That was the reaction. Now, back up a few slides. What were they doing when Jesus sent them out to preach? Healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons. You want me to come up with food? Are you kidding me? That It's impossible. Now, they protested. They looked at their wallets. Anybody ever do that? I'm presenting you with an opportunity here. Well, I'm a little short this week. You know, I'm not sure I can do that. Um, and then Jesus stepped in, <clears throat> and even though there was little food, it was a miracle. Uh, there, suddenly there was enough food, and that was Jesus using the power that he had given to them, um, using it himself. So the disciples were stumped. They believed themselves incapable of doing what Jesus asked them to do. And so we've already read these verses over on the right in Mark where Jesus sent them out and gave them power. Um, would Jesus command them to do that if they were incapable? Is that, is that a question? That's a question I came up with last night. You know, I've, I've often wondered, was that just kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing to say, well, you feed them, just to kind of remind them who they were. But, you know, the more I think about it now in the context of Mark 6 and Matthew 10, they could have fed them. They really could have. They had abilities that, that Jesus had given them. And so he says, you feed them. And they're like, what? Huh? Hmm? Me? Hey, you remember the, you know, when I sent you out and you were healing people and casting out demons? You can't feed people? Okay, I'll do it. Um, why do you think their faith was low? Do you, know, do you think that they um, were deferring to Jesus because he was greater? Perhaps. Now, I ask you a question here. Do you ever defer to somebody else when you could do it? And you think, well, they're, they're better at that than I am. I should let them do that because they're really the pro here. You ever done that? No hands now. <laughs> I didn't ask for a show of hands, but um, yeah, I've done that before too. Yeah, I could take that communion to that person that shut in, but oh, there's, you know, Paul Matches can do that. Paul's good at that. He, he loves doing that. There's, yeah, there's a ministry for that. There's a deacon for that. Um, come on. Really? If you can do something, then you should do it. You know, you should never say, well, somebody else should do that. Um, so I think, again, there's a, a lesson for us that we can take out of this that maybe you hadn't thought about before. So let's move on to our story of walking on water. Uh, again, 
I won't ask for a show of hands. You've heard this story. I'll just go ahead and say it. You've heard this story. You know this story. We're not even going to read the story because you know the story so well. Um, Jesus was exhausted from serving the crowds and he still hadn't had time to mourn. And so Jesus sent the disciples ahead in a boat across the Sea of Galilee. And then a storm came up. And they had been straining against the oars for many hours. So I don't know about you, but it would only take about five minutes of me straining against the oars and I would just be like, I can't do it anymore. You know, and these guys had been basically fighting for their lives out there on the sea um, to make sure they don't capsize. And then Jesus comes walking to them on the water, um, just like out for a stroll. And they see Jesus and they are terrified because they can't, in their minds, they can't imagine this is our friend, Jesus, coming to us on the water. It must be a ghost. And that would be terrifying. But when he gets closer, they see that it's Jesus. Peter asks if he can come, and he does. And then, of course, we know that he, uh, his faith kind of went down and he fell into the water. And then Jesus rescued him. And then the wind died down. And then the disciples said, this must be God in the flesh. And so, remember that high-low thing? I'm terrified, down in the pit. I don't know what's happening here, but we've been fighting these waves for a few hours. We're probably dead now, and we're seeing ghosts. No, whoa, wait a minute, no, that's Jesus. Um, that's great, this is Jesus. And then, you know, they, they see Peter walk on the water. Wow, that's great too. And then when he got in the boat, like glass, the water is like glass because Jesus has gotten into the boat and the seas are completely calm and they exclaim to each other, surely this is God. Paul's got his hand up over here, John. Um, and so they're able to somehow get to that point to say, so before we uh, move on, the account in Mark <clears throat> notes that their hearts were hardened because they had not been able to feed the, the people that were there. So go ahead, Paul. You know, I, I believe, like it says, that God says you can do this. I mean, Jesus says you can do these things. But, you know, this isn't after Pentecost. They hadn't received that miraculous gift of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and given all these powers. So he was nursing them along, trying to tell them, you can do this, mm -hmm. and not telling them that later on they will have, just without his nursing, uh, I'm going to use that term, I don't know why I picked that word, but without that, him cajoling them or, or encouraging them, they will have this power, and they'll be confident because they'll have that indwelling of the Holy Spirit that gives them these powers. Yeah. And right now, he's just, this is the infant stage of them being a, apostles with the powers that Jesus uh, is giving to them. Yeah. And so he's just showing them little bits at a time of what they're going to be capable of. So, yeah, I think... You know, they yeah, they're like little kids at this point. And, and uh, it's, it's just beyond their comprehension that they'd have these abilities. So uh, they don't really have them yet on their own. And they're just, he's trying to show them that you will, I think. In yeah. my well, he had given them some powers, of course, at that point. But um, yeah, but they're still learning. And they're, they're still, they're like little kids in terms of faith. You know, they hadn't really kind of taken it in and said, I can do this because of what God has done for me. And like you said, later on, they're going to receive the Holy Spirit and be able to have more confidence. And that's what you really see what changed after Jesus ascended and the Holy Spirit came upon them. And suddenly, who are these guys? These are just common men. How are they able to be so confident and so just filled with knowledge and, you know, the, the Sanhedrin actually said that about Peter. 
and John, it's like, these are ordinary men. They're, these are not scribes. These are not Pharisees. These are people who, they the yeah, they hadn't, you know, spent their whole life memorizing the scriptures. So it is a big difference. So um, John Mark, uh, hey, John Mark, John Mark has a comment to make. So, oh, were, um, were you done? Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's right. We, 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 we said John, Mark, Paul. Yeah, we got, we got all of them. Go ahead. So we're all in the boat. We all need rescuing. Yep. We're all facing scary bad stuff at different times in our life. We're all sinking. And Jesus comes to rescue us. Yep. No matter what that chaos, whatever that sin, no matter what it is, he has the power over every single bit of all of it. And I just find it so interesting. Only Peter is going to say, well, if it's really you, hey, call me out there. I'll go out there with you. It's like, I'm thinking, if it's really you, come on in here and get in the boat. <laughs> right? And not only does Jesus meet him and help to raise him and talk about his faith and try and but then I almost picture, after that, putting his arm around Peter and walking across the rest of the water, whatever distance that he had just finished covering, right, to go get in the boat. Yeah, maybe. maybe and it's so. just because it says they went and got in the boat. And when yeah. they stepped in the boat, then it calms it down. And just we need to be totally overwhelmed that it is 100% Jesus. Yeah, amen in our lives that saves us no matter what we're going through. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Mark. So we'll kind of go a little bit faster here to uh, try to get to all the pages here. But so it was immediate that Jesus stepped in and helped him. And even though Peter didn't completely succeed, he partially succeeded. And Jesus had to come in and finish the job. And so here we go twice. Jesus came in to finish the job with the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus came to finish the job when Peter failed. Um, but, you know, I, I've also struggled with when Jesus said, you have little faith, why did you doubt? And is that a rebuke? You have little faith. Or is it a good try? Way to go, Peter. You had little faith, but you got at least part of the job done. Or was it just with completely no, no judgment? You've got a little faith. That's good. I don't know. But, you know, I, I, I kind of grew up and heard stories, you know, that was like a rebuke. But I really don't think it was a rebuke. I think, you know, he was successful. And it was, it was something that Jesus was celebrating. I see a disembodied hand up in the booth. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, when Jesus said this to him, he could have had a nice smile on his face. You yeah. Know, I'm sure he said it in a loving way. I'm sure he did too. Yeah, so the question for us today is, can Jesus take my good try and turn it into something amazing? Yes. Yes, he can. And, and I think that's something that we need to take to heart because oftentimes we convince ourselves that I'm not good enough. I can't make this happen. You know, I'm going to blow it. And, and Jesus is saying, just give me a good try here. You know, I'll, I can make something great out of that. You know, don't just sit back and say, I can't do it. Try. Come on. Just try. I can make something amazing happen out of that. Well, we're out of time. Uh, I appreciate everybody's comments.